Today, I'm talking about behavioral ecology of desert hedgehogs with special references with energy budget management. So first of all, this is a desert hedgehog. It's a very, very cute animal. Why you study cute animals? Because it's nice and a good public appeal. And to a certain extent, you can use them as a kind of ambassador for raising biodiversity conservation in the general public. So desert hedgehog is one of 16 to 18 species of hedgehogs. And the castle I have to use. Can, uh, yes, I can see castle. <laughs> and this PE, Palaecinus ethiopicus, it's PE that has a very wide distribution. And because the phylogenetic branches are pretty long, in the future, probably this species may be divided into two species. And many studies on behavior and ecology of hedgehogs are based on European hedgehog. This not necessarily pretty chap, but our much prettier desert <laughs> hedgehogs are less studied. Therefore, when I arrived in Qatar, I thought, okay, we have less studied species and conveniently there are there is a species which has been relatively well studied. Therefore, I thought probably we can we can develop certain hypotheses on the basis of the study of European hedgehogs on some spe um, on this one particular species, which nobody knows very well. So where is Qatar? It's a small country here, a peninsula sticking out from a larger Arabian peninsula. Its natural habitat looks something like this. It's a kind of interesting desert country. Qatar is one of the few countries on this planet where there is no permanent freshwater source on surface. However, nowadays, Qatar is becoming pretty rich and maybe too rich. And then, then they start to change the land use. And many irrigated areas with green vegetation which is completely different from those natural habitats. And probably, even though we don't have data, it's very easy to understand probably they change resource availability as well. So this is Qatar. And this Qatar here, this sort of country, therefore, a lot of interesting organisms, no, not only interesting organisms, many terrestrial organisms, they have to reach Qatar Peninsula through this relatively narrow bottleneck. Therefore, at first, I mean, by the way, this is our study area. There are several farms. So at first, as part of basic information, we expected probably hedgehogs had a bit of phylogenetic structure and there would be more haplotypes near Saudi Arabia and towards the end of Qatar Peninsula their haplotype compositions would be becoming slightly less complicated. That was a kind of ordinary expectations. However, how much do we know about desert hedges? Basically, we don't know. For example, if you type European hedgehogs and desert hedgehogs and Google Scholar. See, desert hedgehogs just 844 and the European hedgehogs 18,500. And if you put behavior, it's even less. By the way, this is based on Google Scholar yesterday. However, if you try to look for in Web of Science, probably this one, would become something like 10. So we really don't know desert hedgehogs. I mean, this is why we had to find out basic information to even develop more specific hypotheses. However, of course, I mean, we can develop vague hypotheses on the basis of European hedgehog studies because they are hedgehogs and hedgehogs and similar things. So first of all, however, to develop hypotheses, we have to collect some basic data. There is a bit of a challenge, or oh, by the way, can you spot three hedgehogs in this photo? The one of my students is handling one. And here there is a hedgehog that she had just handled. 
and still curling up. And another hedgehog is just running into her, almost oblivious about what is happening around. So basically, the hedgehogs are very easy to capture and very easy to handle. However, the challenge is, as Eleanor suggested, I had only female student, and taking female student out to the field is a social challenge. I could have, I, I did it simply because I was complete outsider. So I was forgiven to do something completely antisocial, unacceptably rude things like taking female students to the field. However, still, female student can't come without male relatives. For example, this gentleman is the father of one of the female students. So that, and also they came with, they came with maid who was cooking when we are doing field work. But the problem is, Usually father got bored at around nine o'clock and the hedgehogs are nocturnal. So field work started at six o'clock. By nine o'clock, he started to say, okay, let's go back home. And then they just went back home. And, and my field work alone, field, lonely field work start at around nine o'clock. However, luckily, hedgehogs are so cooperative. They are easy to capture, easy to handle. Therefore, student can do something between six o'clock and nine o'clock before they just leave me alone. And luckily, therefore, during those handling, we can take samples for DNA fingerprinting or some other analysis. And also, luckily, unlike Singapore or Malaysia, Qatar is a desert country. You can just radio track hedgehogs and you can pick up signal anywhere. But if you have to do it here, it's pretty tricky. So we were a bit lucky. And also, another. Oops. Okay. Another thing we are lucky was there was one wonderful resource center I called Hedgehog Nightclub, where many hedgehogs are there and we can capture them. Why did I call it Hedgehog Nightclub? Because they gathered there after sunset, they flirt each other, and they mate. So, so this is a kind of nice hedgehog nightclub. By the way, in behavioral ecology, there are a lot of reasons why females need to gather in some places to make male compete. Because from females' point of view, the, the easiest way to find the fittest male is just let them compete and fight each other, something like that. So it makes sense, so hedgehog nightclub. So, so this is a kind of rubbish stuff. And also you can observe intra and inter specific interactions. By the way, this is a male, this is a female, this is another male. So, so it is a kind of interesting drama that actually you can find out in those domestic rubbish mound. <laughs> so that was another advantage. And also it's amazingly, those desert hedgehogs are so easy to keep and reproduce in captivity. So we set up our own captive colony and some behavioral observations and they bred very well and they are so cute. <laughs> so yes, though unfortunately it is not suitable for field work because of social things. However, we had advantage of so easy to capture them, so easy to breed them and there is a nightclub. And another thing is, like Singapore, it is relatively easy to get money in Qatar. Therefore, we build up an automatic recording station. And because there is no vegetation, you can just get signal very easily. So there are some kind of advantages, even though there are some disadvantages. That is the research environment in Qatar when I was there. Therefore, when I collected data we started to analyze. First of all, on the basis of those individual handling and capturing. So I suggested that we expected that southern part of Qatar had more complicated, let's say, mitochondrial haplotype mosaic. But in reality, we couldn't find that sort of pattern, probably because Qatar is such a small country. Therefore, probably there was no proper phylogeographical structure of hedgehogs. Or another explanation is probably Herr Lim can explain better. We just monitored two relatively short segments of mitochondrial DNA. If we analyze the whole genome, they may give slightly different picture. But in any case, 
it is probably safe to say in cut within Qatar, hedgehog's phylogenetic structure is probably not very clear. And also, how many of them are living there? I mean, we didn't know anything. We know it's desert, therefore probably there are not so many. And, and we recorded each individual, and also we just colored them, we captured them, and we colored them with lipsticks. By the way, I mean, Qatar is a kind of those relatively male, female separated kind of societies. When I first went into local supermarket to try to buy nail polish, I mean, you know, to, to mark her jokes, of course. And the shop assistant looked at me like this. So he, nail polish. Yes, nail polish, please. <laughs> and yes, we marked them. And then this is our result. In Qatar, I mean, our study site is a kind of farmed area. There are many irrigated farms. There are approximately seven hedgehogs per square kilometers. I mean, considering other numbers, those are all Europe. I mean, amazingly, many people studied hedgehogs, but they didn't really estimate population density properly. So there are not so many comparable studies. However, even in Europe, there are some areas where something like less than five hedgehogs per square kilometers. Therefore, considering how unproductive in terms of vegetation in Qatar, seven per square kilometer, I, I felt it's pretty pretty high, maybe because of a hedgehog nightclub. But this is a kind of basic demographic information. And interestingly, wait, humans are sexually dimorphic species in terms of morphology and weight, but hedgehogs, we couldn't find sexual dimorphism in terms of body weight. However, I'm talking about body weight. I'm not talking about skull size, something like that because body weight may react to the, the environment much more flexibly in comparison to certain skull size or spine length, something like that. So I didn't monitor it, but in terms of body weight, there is no sexual dimorphism. However, there is a seasonal difference in terms of body weight. During autumn, winter, their body weight jumps. So that is another information. And then I start to develop more a kind of sophisticated hypothesis, which may or may not work. So does hedgehog hibernate in Qatar? Because if you are interested in heterothermy of vertebrate, hibernation, torpor, is a kind of sexy topic. Of course, that is one of the first topics you want to in investigate. We know that hedgehog hibernate when you, you keep them in captivity and lower the temperature. Do they hibernate in natural environment in Qatar? The only one research at that time was done was in Israel on not closely related, but not, not completely different long-eared hedgehogs. And they hibernate when temperature reaches something like 1920. And this blue line is the minimum temperature or average minimum temperature of each month in Qatar. But just above that long ear hedgehog hibernation threshold. Therefore, I was curious, did desert hedgehog hibernate or torpor? And one of my first students did a feeding experiment. They captured, she captured desert hedgehog and kept in captivities and just keep the cage outdoor and just placed same food every day and try to find out how much hedgehog ate at the end of each night. And like in December, January, she realized that actually hedgehogs didn't eat food at all. It means at least they are very inactive. Therefore, we, we found out probably they torpor at some point. So the information hedgehog in Qatar probably torpor in their natural environment. And also in Qatar, hedgehogs are seasonal breeders. They have two breeding peaks. We don't know same individual would breed twice because Qatar is a very resource scarce environment. However, usually they can breed in captivity, they can breed even three times, but in, in natural environment, at least they have two breeding peaks. 
one larger breeding group in February, March, that sort of thing, just after coming out of Toha, and then second peak, June, July, that sort of thing. Therefore, hedgehog had second chance. This is very important. If seasonal breeders have only one chance from female's point of view and also from male's point of view, they really want to make sure female get pregnant. Because that, if you miss that chance, next chance would be next year. And if you're small mammals, there is a high chance that you may not survive until next breeding season. But hedge, desert hedgehogs, they have at least two chances. Two chances. And then look at male testes during breeding season and non-breeding season looks so different. And almost it, it is human, the equivalent of something like this size. And babies are coming out. It's very, very cute. And then usually they would be weaned by something like 40 days. After 40 days, I mean, based on captive animals, they start to, babies start to eat only solid food. However, can you imagine in the environment where there is no water, mothers need to lactate them for nearly 40 days. It, it's really, really energy consuming. And then this is a kind of uh, development timeline on the basis of captive animals. So mothers need to lactate them for nearly 40 days in the environment where there is no water. Then, okay, so those kind of things we, we can investigate without following them in the field. So then we try to follow them to try to investigate how large they, their home ranges are, because on the base of European hedgehogs, we knew hedgehogs are not territorial. They may have home ranges, but they don't defend it. Therefore, they are not territorial. Humans are territorial so that you need some visa to go to somewhere else, but hedgehogs does. So we tried to do some field work by putting radio tag on hedgehogs. By the way, this is 500 meter scale. So on the base of previous research, something like 500 meter times 300 meter would contain something like four hemiachinus or four European hedgehogs in Israel. So Israel habitat is similar to Qatar habitat to a certain extent, of course, not same. Therefore, I expected more or less 500 to 300 meter square. I can follow probably three to four hedgehogs. Oh, that's easy. That is the equivalent of this circle, uh, this square. So I thought, okay, I can, I can easily follow three or four hedgehogs. So I started to, I, I put a radio tag and started to follow hedgehogs. That was a male called 009 at that time. So 009, I captured and put radio tag on there. And throughout the night, oh, unfortunately, he didn't read textbook. And oh, came back, well done. And okay, okay, keep doing. Wow, they actually run in the middle of nowhere. Therefore, at that time, I was seriously thinking somebody picked up my hedgehog and driving away from me. Because when you are experienced with VHF radio tracking, you understand colors, I mean, radio tags are moving fast, I mean, moving fast away from you. I mean, that is exactly that sort of beeping pattern. So, gosh, who's running with my hedgehog? And then I thought, I was convinced because it's moving towards the road. So I, I was convinced, okay, somebody who didn't put the light and picked up my hedgehog and just running away. But I found that hedgehog there. I was excited and relieved and, and extremely worried about that because they can cover one kilometer within 15 minutes. And then, okay, coming back again. Okay, well done. And then, Moved there too. <laughs> so I thought, okay, so this is just one hedgehog huh? and one night. And they came back. So, so that was a bit of a surprise. 
I mean, I shouldn't have been surprised because Qatar's productivity is so low, therefore, to meet energy budget, probably they have to forage in many places. And many places are pretty empty desert anyway. So, yes, but, you know, I mean, I, I'm a lazy person. Therefore, I don't really want to walk that distance. By the way, so spring and summer, we followed male hedgehogs and female hedgehogs. It's clearly, this is just selected individuals, clearly, left is male. A is male and B is female. Males had larger home ranges. And this is autumn, winter, autumn, winter, non-breeding season. Still males are larger home ranges. I was baffled. If you understood behavioral ecology, this species, which has no, sexually, has no sexual dimorphism in terms of body weight, it means they probably need the same amount of food. If home range is maintained for, uh, for food, they should have similar area of home ranges. That is almost textbook of behavioral ecology. However, in many species, males have much larger home ranges or territory in comparison to females. I mean, therefore, it's not food. Of course, it is for sex. I mean, it makes sense during breeding season, but what is the point of keeping such a large home range during non-breeding season, especially if you, you study European hedgehogs, male home range would shrink during non-breeding season, but in desert hedgehogs, their home range wouldn't shrink even during non-breeding season. It's baffling. So this is the, the result. Home range size, Breeding season, non-breeding season, there is no difference. Only sexual difference is detected. It's really baffling. Still, I don't understand why. Maybe they are stupid. They don't read textbooks. So, you know, I mean, there are many stupid organisms. They don't read textbook. And their home range sizes are second largest amongst the hedgehog species which have been monitored only after the Mongolian hedgehogs, which are living in cold desert, which was probably even less productive than Qatar. Qatar is a hot desert, but in cold desert. So all other hedgehog home ranges are almost one order of magnitude smaller than desert hedgehog home ranges. It means in this resource scarce environment, hedgehogs need to move a lot. That definitely you have to seriously look after your energy budget. So habitat preferences. So to look after energy budget, what sort of priorities do they have? A, B, C, D, E1, E2, F. J just don't worry about those kinds of things. However, you can just see hedgehogs use. Use means even if they are inactive, as long as their radio tags are located there, it is classified as they use. So habitat, a, habitat E2, and habitat E1, and habitat B and D. What are they? Habitat A is a kind of dense hedge, you know, hedge hog, dense hedge. By the way, this is after rain in Qatar. Sometimes habitat would become like this. So habitat A is something like, where is castle? Can you see castle? No, I can't see castle. Ah, oh, yes. Habitat A is something like this. Habitat B is something like this. It's not necessarily associated with the thick hedge, but the green environment. And this is habitat E2, like human created small structure. And this is habitat D, within the farm, but there is nothing. And this is habitat E, outside of the farm and basically pretty monotone boring desert. By the way, my students are radio checking. It's really interesting, isn't it? If you see those people in, in, at night in Singapore, you are probably just jump because you are scared of those black covered people. But so anyway, so these are habitats. And in each habitat, what hedgehogs are doing, this is active, inactive. Can you Remember this habitat A, hedgehogs use habitat A very often. However, most of the time they are inactive because hedgehogs are, 
are having day nest within those hedges. Therefore, they stay there for a long time, but they are not necessarily active there because they are just coming back to sleep. And the habitat B, C, D, E1, B, C plantation, D, E1, they are very active. Our interpretation is because those areas usually they either forage or move. Therefore, basically there is nothing and you just run. So this is why if hedgehogs are there, they don't put out to just sit still, they just travel. So our understanding is there are some key habitats they want to use as a nest or foraging ground and connecting those key habitat by just traveling as quickly as possible. So that is hedgehog land use system. And now, I can't read. Anyway, never mind. So hedgehog in farm areas and more natural areas. So we understood those habitat use, but then, if you just compare those farm areas where our main study area was based, something like this, and the more natural area, of course, we try to find out what would be their, their energy budget. In natural areas, hedgehog had much larger home ranges. Of course, we understand it because resource level is lower. And therefore, this is a comparison site, farm areas, reserve areas, male ranges are much larger than female ranges and also reserve re re region, hedgehog home ranges are much larger than farm areas. And our interpretation is because in, in more natural reserve regions, resource level was low. And also how, Far they travel per night. In reserve regions, they travel a lot. So in reserve regions, they, uh, they use a lot of energy. And naturally in the reserve regions, the hedgehogs are much smaller than farm area hedgehogs. So during, uh, in the farm regions, hedgehogs do not move as much as reserve regions and they are slightly fatter. So like a kind of country people and city people and city people you know, are becoming pretty fat and we don't move. Then based on those basic ecological and behavioral findings, we try to, to develop some hypothesis like heterothermy in mammals. So at last I reached a bit of exciting so heterothermy in mammals is pretty common, even though in textbook usually we say you know, mammals are, are endothermic. But endothermic is not necessarily meaning that we keep the body temperature constant all the time. Humans would do it, but many mammals, their temperature fluctuate. And so, the important example is usually marmot, bears, and we try to add hedgehogs. And look at this. This is a kind of uh, hedgehog radio tracking thing, result in winter between November and February. And the uh, green is active night. Red is inactive night completely. Yellow is part of night is inactive. And the F is female and the M is male. So if you see this one and the overlay, uh, average temperature between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. in the study site, when temperature reaches something like 20, many hedgehogs start to become a bit inactive. But after that, regardless of temperature, males became pretty active again whilst females tend to be pretty inactive until February when the onset of the breeding season. On the following year, the similar pattern, males are much more active than females even during breeding season. This pattern is also observed in European hedgehogs because from males point of view, they shouldn't miss the opportunity when females are coming out of torpor, they have to just grab the females. 
By the way, interesting thing is I didn't study this one. In the future, I want to study this one. When female hedgehog would curl, male hedgehogs can't do anything. I mean, to a certain extent, humans as well. To mate, you need cooperation. Otherwise, I mean, it is extremely, extremely difficult. Even though human males are physically much stronger than females, still, it is not easy. And hedgehogs, sexual dimorphism is almost none. Therefore, when female would curl up, males can't do anything. However, I observed sometimes three or four males are just moving around one female. But from female's point of view, I mean, this is a speculation. When, when one male comes, of course, I mean, you can't just bargain yourself. You just curl up and then attract more males and just let male fight. And then just uncurl at some point and make the last male standing. However, then what happens if female would never uncurl? The one key thing is, again, this is a speculation, small mammals need to eat a lot. Therefore, if female would continue to curl, she loses important time for foraging. Therefore, from male's point of view, you have to just stick around females until females just think, oh, I need to eat, I'm so hungry. So then females may just uncurl and tell male's message that, okay, I'll give you a shove, so let me go to eat. Then pre-mating competition, then we have to think about post population competition as well. Therefore, how females can choose the best male? Can they choose or they can't choose? That is a kind of interesting question. At the moment, I don't have any data to even speculate. But in any case, that is a bit of interesting sideline. Then what we found by following them and constantly monitoring weight, we found something really weird things. For example, right hedgehogs is much leaner than left hedgehogs, by the way. Left hedgehogs are released hedgehogs from captivity. I mean, look at how fat they can become. Sometimes we have to control diet because otherwise they couldn't even curl up. <laughs> when they try to curl up, the, those adipose tissues are just, just coming so they couldn't even curl up. But these are lean wild hedgehogs. So the, what we found out is, Okay, this is time of activity. The dark is female and white is male. You understand that actually in colder months, females are much more inactive in comparison to males. Already I explained to you. And in December, it is statistically significant. Then we monitored the body weight of same individual hedgehogs throughout winter. And we just compared the percentage body mass loss since November. So November's body weight is 100. And how much body weight they lost in successive months? In December, again, it is statistically significant. Inactive females lost more weight than active males. I was completely baffled because textbook, again, my head jobs didn't read textbook, because because the, the, the benefit of pauper is usually linked with energy saving. Therefore, I expected inactive females would lose less percentage of weight in comparison to active males. But pattern is completely opposite. I have been incorrect and wrong many times. That is one of the examples I was wrong because I expected females' body would be body weight would be constant, males' body weight would be going down because males are active during winter. Then people said, but Novi, you know, I mean, you don't know the resource availability in winter in Qatar. Qatar is such a hot country, therefore, in winter there may be more insect or ground dwelling invertebrates, which Eleanor's love affair of exoskeleton kind of small critters. So, so one of the students monitored ground dwelling invertebrate population. Okay, ground dwelling, therefore we didn't argue flying insect, unfortunately we couldn't. But so ground dwelling insect biomass is sharply declining towards winter. Therefore, okay, so male hedgehogs are active, 
during winter where their energy expenditure is higher because they have to keep body weight and they don't have a lot of things to eat. And yet they don't lose body weight as much as torporing females, inactive females. That is a kind of question that I try to answer why this happens. And, oh, by the way, this is the body weight. Therefore, in spite of decreasing ground dressing insect uh, invertebrate bias, their body weight is, is, is also pretty high. So, first of all, we found that males may maintain large home ranges, even during non-breeding season. However, they travel much less. So this makes sense. Okay, so males are active and still maintain large home ranges. However, they don't travel within the home ranges as much as during the breeding season. This is definitely one way to save energy. But by the way, look at this. Female is almost none. And also, another thing is, I'm coming back to this hedgehog nightclub again and again. Another thing is, this artificial domestic rubbish mound provides a lot of resource. Therefore, at least in our study site, active male hedgehogs would go there to eat. Inactive females, by definition, because they are inactive, they don't go there to forage. Therefore, at least in our study site, during winter, males do not travel as much as during breeding season, and males would go to hedgehog nightclub to nibble many things very easily. Our guess is that is why male hedgehogs wouldn't lose a lot of weight, even though they are active during non-breeding season. Then the question is, does it hold to other habitat where there is no hedgehog nightclub? But again, we don't have data, but it is a kind of interesting potential study. By the way, funny thing is, this is another slight sideline, but look at this male tries to mate female. Can you see the female erect all the spines and jump backward? Mm -hmm. So love is so painful. So this male was the last, <laughs> last male standing. There were, there were three other males courting this female. So when I approached accidentally, I mean, three other males just running away. Of course, they don't deserve that female if they are just running away. But this male was just so, so consistently sticking to that female. And when hedgehog mate, males expose soft part of belly over the female spine and bite the spine to grab her. Then females suddenly erect all the spine and jump backward. See, and unless males are so persistent, they can't mate it. And even if they mate it, they may be just completely eradicated in post-copulation sperm competition or something like that. So it is a kind of interesting love stories in Hedgehog nightclub. So, so utilization of resources locally available. There is another key in Qatar. What resources are available extra in Qatar? Of course, oil and money. But hedgehogs do not use oil or do not use money either. So what they use is a solar radiation. Desert is, is very resource scarce region. However, there is an ample resource of solar radiation. They bask. When my postdoc came back, they, not be, so many hedgehogs are on on the surface, they are not really going into burrows or anything. I thought it's very, very strange. But it said, I mean, we put temperature sensor on the tag, but of course it is a kind of outside the tag, not the implanted tag. Temperature sensor means it tells you the temperature of mixture of ambient temperature and hedgehog body temperature. So basically monitoring ambient temperature, if temperature would reach more or less higher than hedgehog body, uh, body temperature. Then again and again, at first I thought it's a kind of mistake, but again and again, temperature sensor tells there's a, in winter, there is a, the surge of tag temperature during daytime. At first we thought, oh, tag was broken, oh, pity. But because pattern comes again and again, 
we thought, okay, let's investigate. Then we went to the field and the hedgehogs are just underneath the sun. And then later, by automatic monitoring, we just followed their 24 hour temperature fluctuations. Before inactive period, like this is October, daytime temperature peak is not extremely higher than this, by the way, this blue line is ambient temperature, not much higher than ambient temperature, but in November, these peaks appear. So clearly, if peaks didn't appear in October, still temperature was pretty, ambient temperature was pretty high. And appeared in November when hedgehogs would become inactive means hedgehogs are proactively basking. So they deliberately tries to use solar radiation to, to reduce the cost of their thermal regulation. That is our interpretation. And probably this is not far from the truth. So the take home message is, desert is a non-productive environment. Yes, we all know that. Thank you very much for telling us that. So some human activities may increase resources for hedgehogs, at least in certain level. And the male desert hedgehogs maintain large home ranges even during the non-breeding season, which I still am baffled. Why is that? There must be some sort of benefit. And it is presumably for their reproductive benefit because otherwise we can't really guess why. And to do so, they have to reduce energy expenditure in, in non-breeding season. And probably they do so by moving slowly. They still maintain large home ranges, but they move very slowly. And also good thing is they don't have to defend the territory because they are not territorial. And probably they proactively utilize solar radiation to help their thermal regulation. So that is what I can safely say on the basis of current evidence. And of course, if anybody wants to study hedgehogs in Qatar, on basis of those kind of things, you can develop more interesting and more sophisticated behavioral ecological hypothesis to test. But at the end, I have to tell you one thing of Anthropocene. Like we all study climate change and what is happening in Anthropocene, nature-based solutions or sustainabilities. In Qatar, this is the natural habitat. But during the later stage of Anthropocene, habitat changed a lot. And this sort of irrigated farms also appeared and hedgehog nightclubs. And this really benefited some hedgehogs in terms of increasing their population reproductive success. And of course, it is as anthropo anthropogenic as reducing hedgehogs by just building a road. So one anthropogenic thing would increase their population, another anthropogenic thing would reduce. Therefore, some people say, oh, this is good because hedgehog population is increasing. However, it is depending on your personal values. If hedgehog population is artificially increased, it is as unnatural as they are artificially decreased. So it's depending on your own personal values. But definitely we are facing that sort of error now because these Asian lion populations just coming into the village to steal some cows. And nowadays near Mumbai, there are some leopard populations. Therefore, some organisms try to utilize human created environment and human created resources. And probably we have to think about those kinds of things. If tapir would come to Singapore from Malaysia by just swimming straight, at the moment, I think Singaporean authorities just contact Malaysian wildlife department to just capture them and, and take back to Malaysia. When elephant comes, they do the same thing. However, interestingly, is there any possibility in the future, I'm thinking, to, to actually tolerate those organisms? Of course, we have to bear a certain cost, but probably we are living in interesting natural experiment. And if people's personal values and their concept and customs would, would may change, in the near future, 
we may have slightly different city landscape. Maybe there are a lot of hedgehogs and a lot of tapir car accidents, those kind of things may even happen in Singapore. So of course, that sort of study can't be done by myself. So especially thank you very much for those people. But of course, there are so many other people that I can't name all of them for helping this uh, research. Thank you very much.